Welcome to Robotics and Automation News Webinars, where you can be part of a global event without leaving your home or office. Attend our live webinars and communicate directly with influential professionals in your industry. Hello, my name is Abdul Montakim. I'm editor of roboticsandautomationnews.com. In this interview, I speak to Julian Sumi of Wiferian, which produces wireless charging technology for warehouse vehicles such as automated guided vehicles, or AGVs, and autonomous mobile robots, or AMRs. Electrification, batteries, and charging technologies are all very interesting subjects to a lot of people right now. So after Julian's presentation, I ended up asking him quite a lot of questions, making the entire interview quite long, so my apologies for that. But as I say, it's a very interesting subject to a lot of people, and Julian was patient enough to provide insightful answers to all my questions. Hey. Good morning or good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julian, uh, Julian Zäumer. I'm from the company Viaferian, uh, who is a wireless energy startup uh, from Germany. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to be today on roboticsautomationnews.com. Um, I'm uh, the CMO here, uh, as well as the head of sales. And uh, yeah, I would love to share a little bit uh, what we do and how we think we can change the way energy is transferred with that kind of little blue plate, which is um, the core of our business. So um, in order to get you an idea what we're doing and how we would like to change the way energy is transferred to robotics and AGVs and mobile robotics and uh, industrial trucks, I think I'm going to share a little bit about, about our story and, and how we've reached to that point, um, what, what we're doing now. So let me quickly share my screen. I hope that's fine now. I hope you can see the PowerPoint. So. We basically call it Viferian Freedom for Robots and AGVs, Wireless Charging for Smarter Processes. And, and why are we doing that? And what it is, is it? So coming from the back uh, end of the, the company, we've been founded six years ago, roughly, from four very smart guys that uh, were doing solar uh, systems and were optimizing batteries, lithium ion batteries. And they basically had a research project where they found out how to uh, develop an inductive charging systems to power up a uh, car, so an, an, an e-mobility. Um, and um, they were quite successful and they put a lot of thought in there and then it said, okay, how can we use that invention or that really, really small size package and transfer high voltages and high amperes of power to a car? Why don't we use it in another industry, which has already been fully implemented to be, um, to have electronic, um, yeah, uh, vehicles like ro robots and uh, industrial truck. So they looked at the um, at the opportunities, what is available, and uh, uh, coming back, where does it all start? I mean, everyone from us knows we have smartphones nowadays. We have those little paths where we add our our phone to, and um, apparently it charges without any cables. So nowadays it's it's fully normal to not plug your phone or to not use uh, let's say or to, to to use toothbrushes that are also charged inductively. So basically the um, invention was not that uh, of a new deal, but coming to a product that worked uh, in that very challenging and new revolutionary uh, industry of mobile robots, that was the key to think about how to implement it perfectly. So we all know there's a huge growth phase. Everything has been automated and uh, it starts to be flexible. And they thought, okay, what's gonna be in the future? So we thought in the future, it's quite sure the logistics and the production side, they will mostly will be lights out and fully automated. So everything is moving. Uh, it needs to be run smoothly and seamless perfectly. And of course, as it's moving nowadays, everything needs to be powered. And uh, from our point of view, I think it's, it's not the issue that you have, need to have huge and largest uh, uh, battery sizes. It's more or less the key is how to transfer the energy uh, on the right time. And so that was basically the fit that we thought that's where we need to bring our product to the market. So think about, you never have to think about charging your HV or you never have to think about what's happening after six hours of running with my industrial truck. I have to go somewhere. I have to 
change the battery system or I have to plug it in for four to six hours to charge it. Just imagine that break, that is a lot of money, of course, because it costs you and the vehicle is not uh, either not available or you have to do a change um, of the battery, which is also costly, sometimes dangerous, depending on the size of the batteries and it needs manpower at the moment. So just imagine you don't have that break anymore. So how much vehicles could you basically eliminate? How much of, the, of your spares you don't need because the system could more or less run 24 seven. So, that's basically when we looked at the situation, how our forklifts and AGVs are charged at the moment and what is what is a bottleneck, we found it's the transfer, it's the transferring of the energy. So nowadays I just brought some examples. Charging rooms are typical, they are huge space taking. Uh, you need to make sure you have room for it. If you use lead acid batteries, you need to have ventilation. Um, other stuff is, of course, wire charging. So when you ever plug your AGV or you plug your forklift, um, that, that's going to be standing somewhere and you have normally to go to a dedicated position. Uh, and an alternative, which is actually quite um, traditional and, and in place in the industry, are charging contacts. So basically, you go somewhere, you have to, uh, you, you can almost uh, automate it. Um, quite well, but you still have that kind of high pressure on the vehicle and you need to make sure the contacts are perfectly aligned and all is fine. So these are some examples we brought. We, we, we saw some of our customers who are very, let's say, proud of showing their, their vehicles and how many they have on the fleet. But if you look at the picture and you see what do they have, they have actually that capital. They have capital which is standing uh, on, in, in the corner and getting charged. Um, which is which is needed and fully understandable, but it's not what you want to have. You want to have your vehicle be productive and you want to have it running. So looking at the alternatives I just mentioned, we have certain limitations when you want to fully automate your um, your vehicle or your warehouse or your production site. So looking at the left side, um, these are like standard cable chargers. They are fine and they're working and they are efficient, but you have to have that kind of manpower that plugs it um, and uses the cable connection to your vehicle. In the middle there, these are the contacts which are uh, quite easy to use, but sometimes hard to implement. You have to make sure you get into the ground, you have, an, uh, you have quite a lot of infrastructure work in order to make sure your, your uh, charging station uh, safe and uh, well implemented. And of course, um, there's quite a, uh, a lack of um, uh, chances that something goes wrong. You have to clean them, etc. And of course, we know on the, on the right side, um, we have those typical changing of large battery packs, which is still, I think, especially in the US and in Europe, quite common to do. Still, that is huge investments of the, of the um, infrastructure and you need someone to do it. So looking at the data, we found out that mostly vehicles are 20 and up to 20 to 30% of the times they are out of the process, which is of course, huge investment loss. The batteries are normally really oversized because you need to make sure your vehicle is running, which is fully understandable. Um, but nowadays, I think we think there's a better way to do it. They're coming into the industry of 4.0. There is quite a difficulty to get the data you want to have. So sometimes you, you're driving black in the dark and you don't know what's the situation of the vehicle, what's the data, uh, how's the battery, what's the life, uh, the, the life situation, et cetera. So it's quite, let's say a guessing when you have to go um, to, to exchange your battery. And the last one compared uh, to, to an inductive charging system which I'm gonna show you in a second. Um, when you go with those automated contacts, they, they are quite fine. But um, the risk of failure and cleaning, that, that's unfortunately the issues where all the AGVs manufacturing uh, companies are dealing with at the moment, because you cannot really automate it for a couple of days you, because you need some kind of cleaning, um, et cetera, of the context. So why is Wifarian new to that? And why are we changing uh, the industry? Basically, it's quite simple. We would like to um, enabling the electrified economy by unleashing the full potential of industrial e-vehicles. That, that's a nice say, but what it, does it really mean? Basically, we eliminate the cable, we eliminate the contacts, and we turn it fully automated in a very high efficient way. 
So similar as your phone, we would like to have vehicles being fully automated charged by getting to charging stations without having a contact and transferring the energy over a magnetic field through the air. So looking at the, uh, at the concept, it basically has four elements. So what we do with the product in order to eliminate those kind of charging breaks, we want to implement the charging in the process, meaning when there are like natural stops uh, during the process of either loading or unloading or driving through a production site uh, and the vehicle stops anyway between 10 seconds to one, two, three, four, five minutes, we're going to use that kind of small time um, where the system stops and we're going to highly charge it with a high uh, energy voltage and uh, ampere during that stopping break. The elements of the systems is quite simple. There's four elements. One is a wall box, basically, which you plug on, 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 onto the grid on your uh, facility or factory. Then there's one of those plates, which is, which is 10 by 10 inches. So it's, 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 very, it's a very small plate. And it's also very thin, it's uh, 15 millimeters. So it's easy to implement that into your vehicle or on the ground or on the site. I'm gonna show you some other um, applications how you, are, how you can do that, for example. And a similar plate is going either into the ground, on the floor, at the, um, at the walls. Uh, you can even put a, a stand or somewhere. And one more small box, is then the electronics in the vehicles, which is attached to the battery system. And as soon as the systems are somehow reaching to each other and uh, the vehicle arrives on the loading platform, the two systems are communicating with each other. So there, there's no touching, there's no one putting any button, there's, there's no one pressing a button, there's no one uh, giving the direction, please charge now. Basically, it's a very smart uh, in the charging system, which starts talking to each other. And then the vehicle tells the charging platform, hey, I'm here, I'm empty, I only have 50% battery uh, level, please give me 60 ampere of charging. And as soon as that happens in, in roughly one second, we immediately transfer high voltage and high energy um, in, in less than a second. And immediately the magnetic field basically starts and the energy is transferred magically more or less uh, to the vehicle. And now the question is, yes, we, we, have, we have those uh, similar, let's say applications where you have the contact chargers basically put into the ground, um, as I mentioned. So why is that new? It's new because it's better, it's cheaper and it's more safe uh, and it's simpler to do than doing the same stuff with contact chargers. Um, I brought a, a small overview of how the, um, how, how the, the benefits of inductive charging uh, are more or less. So first of all, th those kinds of plates are 100% water resistant. We have a high IP65. So we even have customers that uh, are doing the charging, not in the hall or factories anymore. They actually place it outside because they have to do, let's say, um, for example, with the industrial truck anyway, do a turn to another uh, warehouse and pick some up. So that would be one advantage. We also had a customer last, uh, or actually last month, who told us they had a flood in their factory, uh, which is not common, of course, but uh, they had open contacts and everything was broken afterwards. So it's a very solid and industrial standard um, made product. The second thing is I call it one for all system. The system is quite smart because it can charge any kind of batteries. And that means any kind of vehicles. So we don't care if it's a lithium ion battery or it's a lead acid battery. We don't, we don't care if it's 24 volt or it's 48 volt. The system basically provides the same and the right um, energy what is requested by the vehicle arriving on the charging platform. Um, high positioning tolerance, that's also a comparison to the contact chargers. That means we don't, we don't care if you're three centimeters off left, right, top, uh, down. There's a high clearance distance as well, up to four centimeters. That means you don't need to have the perfect navigation system in your AGV, or if you're a manual truck, which is also actually quite used, you don't have to do, you have to be that precise in order to reach the charging level. Um, highest efficiency means compared to inductive charging systems that have been around uh, quite a long time, I think in the 80s, uh, first time being implemented, they normally have been, let, let's say, line inductive chargers, 
which been implemented into the ground of the warehouse uh, in the infrastructure. And uh, that was that was quite well. The AGVs were driving on the line. They had uh, they're powered up all the time, so they don't have to do uh, charging uh, breaks. But the efficiency on those systems are around 50 to maybe 60 percent because you basically are all the time on. You're basically all the time active. The system now is only going to start to uh, generate those magnetic fields when a vehicle arrives on the platform, which also is a huge advantage in terms of uh, safety and security. Um, the top ones on the right, no tearing and no cleaning, that's, I think that's one of the biggest advantage. Um, it, it's not a, a big issue to, to have a charging contact if you charge once a day. But if you have a fleet of, let's say, 200, 300 HVs running in your warehouse and they all are using constantly charging uh, contacts or you have to plug in all the time um, a charging cable, those things are not done to be used, let's say, 500 times a day. So if you have those very short um, stoppage breaks and you want to give only in seconds and maybe minutes energy, you have to have a system that is reliable, that you, do, that you can make sure uh, everything runs smoothly, even after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks without touching the charging system. Looking to the, to the bottom, um, the system starts quite fast, so you are after one second, you are in, in high level of charging, which is uh, crucial if you only have 20 seconds of charging time, for example, uh, during a short stop of loading of the vehicle, and then the vehicle goes on. Um, also, the omnidirectional charging, that's, that's something basically we, we can arrive on a platform any side, so you don't have to make an extra turn to hit on the right uh, spot. And that's, I think, the key to be, let's say, having a smart um, charging solution, we transfer immediately data through a, con through a CAN connectivity and a connection. Whenever a vehicle arrives on the charging uh, paths, we not only transfer the energy, we basically also transfer all the data from the vehicle into a cloud system and try more or less to optimize then fleet management. Um, or maintenance or uh, uh, predictive uh, topics which you can do and know exactly what is the status of the battery, what's the status of the vehicle, where's my fleet at the moment, etc. So that is as a quick glance, uh, what are we doing and, and basically how, how does it how does it be installed? Is it difficult? Actually, it's also very, very um, a big advantage compared to other huge large charging systems, which are heavy to have, let's say, the contacts when you need to have a very stable system. As we don't have any, um, any weight or, or any power or any pressure on any part of the system as stairs on our contacts, that's a huge advantage also in, in terms if you want to change your layout of a warehouse or a production site. I, I brought you some uh, installation uh, examples. Here you can see some HVs or a tucker train uh, in the middle or uh, actually a mobile robot or someone. So basically just implementing those, you can either just attach it more or less on the vehicle or you can in-design it perfectly. You can do it on the side, you can do it uh, on the bottom. And the good thing is uh, the installation side on the hallways or in the infrastructure is also quite simple. Of course, if you're having very heavy duty vehicles with uh, six, seven, eight tons, you have to have a very um, stable um, installation into the ground. But let's say looking at the standard size, what we are dealing with are AGVs with a payload of maybe 200 to 500 kilograms to carry pallets or making transportation of buckets or whatever. We basically just, we just place uh, some kind of rubber mat um, as you can see here on, on, on the left side. It's basically a rubber mat. Uh, our system is implemented. It's, it's not even an inch high. Um, and the vehicle easily is, uh, drives over it. And just imagine you're going to change your warehouse layout. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of big of investments to change it. You basically take it off from the floor, draw it to five meters left, and then plug it into your power again. And you can start charging the same way as you did before. So um, as I said, there's also alternatives where you can put it on the side or on the wall or on the, on the um, uh, yeah, some kind of, of an in infrastructure of the, of your factory or warehouse. Um, that's, that's the overview of, of the product now. But why is it such a 
big difference compared to other solutions. And there I would like to go a little bit into the application and what is now from our point of view and from customers, we use what's possible already. So what we do, what we think and what we believe and what we've calculated is that the fleets can be reduced by up to 30% of vehicles by integrating the charging into the process. So we call it in-process charging. Um, I mentioned it before, we, what we do is basically put the charging point directly into the process as there are no open contacts, it's not dangerous. There's, there's nothing, you cannot drip over it if you, if you have to, let's say, still have workers on the site. And whenever a vehicle performs a stopping time anywhere to do an activity on the shop floor or on the warehouse, there's a chance to implement that little charging pad and make sure it, if it needs, it gets a certain amount of energy recharged uh, into the vehicle. And looking at the, at the issue, so looking at how does a typical log uh, logistic loop look at the moment? Looking at the top line, um, AGVs or industrial trucks, they perform a typical logistic loop. There's also one example, the Tucker trains with the carts in the back. They have a typical loop where they drive all the time. So they do it, let's say, six, seven, eight times uh, an hour. And they always stop at the same position, picking stuff up, delivering stuff, um, or just doing any handling activities. Um, nowadays, you have to have those guys powered after a certain time when the energy is empty. And they drive somewhere into a charging pot, then there's a guy plugs it in, or it's been automated, been charged. I mean, there's different, different solution. Or as I mentioned, you exchange the battery, which is 400, 500, 600 kilograms. Um, and that, of course, is possible, but it's costly. It takes time and you need manpower. And basically, you have a, a certain number of your vehicles sitting somewhere and not being productive. So looking at the down, what, what we would like to uh, achieve, uh, and, and I don't get me wrong, it's, there's still there's a lot of uh, use cases, but not all of them are good business cases. So we also have to see it, it has to be the right size. It, it should make sense. You have to have the right stops. But looking at that, we can implement those charging stops and basically fully eliminate those stopping uh, breaks. And that's definitely what is what we need to have in the industry. We want to have all the vehicles working and not sitting and being unproductive because those guys are very expensive. And we want to make sure the investment we do uh, and looking at the investment on, on, the, on the charging side is much, much smaller compared to, of course, the investment of the AGV. So that's, that's what we want to do. We want to make sure we can charge and have our, our fleet running basically all the time. I brought one more other example, which gives a little bit an idea how, uh, how we could do. That's a little bit, let's say, may, maybe chaotic, but uh, let's, let's go through it. I, I guide you through. So what we see here is uh, seeing a day of um, a fork, uh, a fork truck driver, uh, a forklift driver. So just imagine the gray uh, little line, which starts at 100% state of charge. Um, he starts this morning at six o'clock. The the industrial uh, trucks or the uh, the forklift is full. He drives, makes a first cigarette break. Um, he has a second shift from eight until 10. He uses the restroom for a second. Uh, he has another drive for another two hours where he have a, a 15 minutes break uh, to have a little coffee and have a little uh, second breakfast. And then there's a second time from 12 until two where he's basically performing his duties on his industrial truck. Nowadays, no one would ever drive in those five or 10 minute breaks to a charging room, plug in the industrial truck, and then go back uh, to, the, to the restroom or the cafeteria, then walk back to the charging room, unplug it and go driving. So nowadays what we do, we basically uh, empty the battery. We, after the shift, we go to the changing room or we go to the plug room and we change the whole battery system, which is a huge investment of infrastructure or manpower. And then the next guy or um, the same guy goes on and does the same uh, again. Just imagine now every those five, 10 to 10 minutes breaks, we would charge that battery with high voltage again and have high power. That would basically come out to that little blue line, which shows you we keep the level of the battery actually always in a high fill, filled uh, energy level. So meaning not only you don't have to perform the battery change anymore, but 
you can also actually eliminate a lot of the capacity at all because you normally, when you have those standard breaks being at the, um, uh, when, you have, when you have the chance to charge in between, you don't have those kind of huge capacity additionals which you need in order to make sure you get through the day. So of course, it's a case by case um, uh, situation. We have to look, does it make sense? Where can we implement it? Um, does it work? But the good thing is there's no really efforts needed by the drivers or there's no one really needs to do any activities, just place uh, the car or the e-vehicle or the industrial truck at the right spot, take your time, have your cigarette break, have your recovery break, you come back and your vehicle is being charged another 10 to 15% again. So that's basically the idea behind it. And where are the applications where we nowadays are also operating? Um, of course, warehouses and, and e-commerce, but on the other hand, a very, very good um, application is actually production because nowadays the production changes also from um, a line production going to metrics productions, where especially automotives, for example, having their own little or large AGV with drives uh, the chassis of the car during the production uh, cycles and steps through the different stopping steps where a certain production um, activity is then performed. So this is a perfect application to place those kind of inductive charges in the process and making sure the AGVs are running 24 seven, which then eliminates additional vehicles, of course. Um, yeah, now basically to, it, it, it was a lot of tech talk and I hope it was still interesting to understand. I brought you some examples that you can get a better idea what we're doing already now. We have, as you can see, quite a lot of uh, customers and especially now in Europe, we actually are uh, starting to go into the US nowadays. Um, we've been the first time gonna be on Promat in April, 2021. So please, if you have a chance to go there, look at Vifarian and uh, hopefully we can, we can meet up there and you can learn more and ask questions. And I'm also very interested to understand what are your pains, what are your problems in terms of optimizing charging in your vehicles and in your production and warehouses. And that's basically our first step into the US. So please uh, visit us as, uh, at the Promat DX in April, 2021. As I said, some more examples, and then we are done. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the best application is a Tucker train, because the Tucker train makes always uh, normally the same route. It picks up material, it goes to a production site, it, it returns the waste, and normally there's stopping times from two to seven minutes in order to charge or load and unload um, the cars which are, which are pulled. And at that time, that, that, that's a perfect situation to uh, keep your vehicle on a high level of energy so you can eliminate uh, the charging brakes and you don't have to have spare batteries or even spare uh, vehicles. Um, I mean, that, that is a typical application from, I think that's a French manufacturer who does uh, self-driving AMRs and uh, AGVs. Um, they, what they do, and that's, that's quite easy to understand here, whenever they have those kind of handover plays uh, of material boxes, um, the, the vehicle anyway has to stand between 15 to 45 seconds. And as the system is starting so quickly in under one second to, uh, to pull uh, full power into the system, that is uh, basically the, uh, the key of their application. They eliminate additional vehicles and they win projects compared to other AGVs because they can offer less vehicles for the same um, amount of boxes being transported, for example. And that means overall, there's a lower price for the end customer and meaning the customer, um, the, the AGV manufacturer can win more projects compared to others because the process, what they have been implemented are more um, efficient. Um, that is actually one of the biggest customers we have in Europe at the moment. And they are doing two things. They're doing um, AGVs, which are, uh, in, which are basically have an implemented in the inductive charging system, but they also do uh, industrial trucks, which are also automated. And uh, that is the perfect symbiosis to have a similar kind of charging, but so they can use the same charging uh, spot for either industrial trucks or the AGVs so they also are eliminating different kinds of systems sitting around and costing and need to, needing to maintain, be maintained. 
And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's it so far. I hope uh, it was a first good idea what we're doing and why we believe it's so important to think about the part of en how energy is transferred, because uh, we believe that's a big game changer in the future of intro logistics and warehousing and production. And yeah, um, I'm very grateful that uh, robotics automation uh, was able to yeah give me that little time and hopefully I could yeah, give you some news, uh, some new ideas and let's talk about it. Okay, thank you very much, Julian, for an excellent and fascinating presentation. It makes me uh, think of lo loads of questions. Um, I'm going to try and limit them to a few because obviously we haven't got all day, but uh, there are lots of questions. I mean, it's a very interesting area and it's new to me to, to some extent, so I may be asking some very simple questions. I hope you don't mind. I'll, I'll start Please with. Um, don't mind. This. Yeah. That, I believe if it's new to new, it is it, is a new question uh, to you, sir. For that, saying that there's going to be many many people out there who have maybe similar questions because we see that all from webinars. We that that's a new way of thinking. We all know the phones and we know how that somehow it works, but we never thought about how can we not use it in a smarter way for larger vehicles. So please go ahead. I'm open and hope I can answer all them. Yeah, I'm sure you can, because some of it was already in the uh, presentation, but I, I would, you know, like a little bit of an elaboration. Uh, sure. First, um, let's talk about the context in which you have, your company has emerged. The context meaning um, the previous systems, you mentioned the, the plug-in types and other types, yeah. uh, and I did find that interesting, but I, wouldn't, I, I hope you won't mind repeating and elaborate on the alternatives, the kind of systems that are already in there uh, being used and, and um, you know, the, uh, how you fitted in or decided to emerge in, I think it was 2018, you started producing your um, system since then. Yeah. So yeah, please elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah I understand. I start one, one step before. So as I said, there were four guys, they were researching on a very uh, renowned research institute in Germany, it's called Fraunhofer. And they basically had the task in their little group to develop a charging system for e-mobility. So they had um, a little bit bigger than what I, what I showed, um, maybe, maybe double the size. But um, they had created in their research time those kind of charging plates, which we put they put on the ground, and then they came with an e-vehicle with a battery-driven car, and they had to make sure they somehow transport energy over 20 centimeters. So that's that's quite a big gap to to transfer energy without any contact, and they reached a 95% efficiency for 22 kilowatt. So that is a lot of power. That's if you compare it to um, to those electrical electrical um, toothbrushes, a toothbrush charges roughly with one watt. So imagine on a plate, let's say 20 inch by 20 inch, uh, or or 30 centi 35 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters, they were charging 22,000 uh, toothbrushes with an efficiency of 95%. And then they said, okay, that's an amazing, that's an amazing um, result. But at the moment, that was like around six, seven years ago, I don't have an, uh, an opportunity to go into the world of uh, e-mobilities because the, there is no clear way it's going to be. Uh, if it's going to be e-mobility, how is the way to charge? There's so many been different players in the industry. So they were looking where else could we use that technology in an area which is, let's say, um, closed and it's already been running fully electrical? And they found the infrastructure of uh, intralogistics, where you have lots of the vehicles being uh, driven on batteries already, especially the emerging market of AGVs. And they were looking, what kind of alternative do they have at the moment? And one alternative is, yes, of course, we have to plug after a certain time, meaning six hours runtime, four hours uh, charging. And that means there's, let's say 30, 40, 50% of the time, the vehicle is not being productive. So that was the first thing. Alternative is contact charger. Contact charger means basically two uh, metal plates are touching each other with a lot of pressure. And that's like open contact. And then the energy is transferred 
through that little um, touching spot. Meaning also you have to have the right pole and the left pole more or less plus and minus being aligned and you may need to make sure you don't have any misalignment. And the problem is always when you have contacts, there's gonna be a rip off, there's gonna be dirt, there's gonna be after certain times of using it, you need to make sure those kind of charges are clean because the energy is only being proper being transferred from one side to the other if you have a very clean, a clean surface. And that was the reason why I said, okay, let's make a system that's perfectly, so we, they, they reduced the size. It didn't start with 22 kilowatts. We didn't, we got, went down, what are the perfect sizes for AGVs for industrial trucks? And we ended up having a system that has 3000 watt, so three kilowatt in the size of, as I said, 10 inches by 10 inches, very thin and easy to implement either on the ground or on the vehicle. And that's basically how the whole story started. And yes, we are producing since 2018 in zero. So we had some prototypes, of course, but now since 2018, um, we are manufacturing on a professional industrial level. Right. Um, and uh, how long, I don't know if I missed this, but uh, how long does uh, a vehicle take to fully charge. I mean, I know different vehicles obviously are different sizes, their batteries are different, and some may have more than one battery to charge. So it's difficult to sort of give one answer, but what are the ranges, Absolutely. if you like, the typical sort of ranges, time? Uh, yeah, go ahead. It, it's definitely, as you, you, you're fully right, it it's fully depends on the application, on the vehicle size, basically not on the vehicle size, but on the battery size. How much energy does it need uh, to drive? Um, how big is the battery as well? And so what, what, we are, um, what we are doing is we do some kind of research together with the customer and he plans, for example, to do a 21 or 22 um, ampere hours battery into a, let's say a small AGV. And then you have to see, okay, what would be the, per, um, the steps being performed on the warehouse floor, on the manufacturing floor? And then you have to um, have to decide how many charging spots you're gonna implement. Because the key is to always have small power um, being, let's say, or, or very short times to power up in a high efficiency way with high power. Uh, meaning your questions is very hard to answer, but looking at those kind of graphs we had, we can charge um, with, normally with the batteries we, we, uh, we supply or we also uh, recommend, in it on a 2C or even 5C level. So one hour running time and with a 5C level, we, we can charge in about 12 minutes. So you have 12 minutes charging time over a one time, one hour uh, running time. So that, that's gonna be one of the options we, what we are offering and discuss with the customer. But again, it's really depending on the size of the battery on the size of the vehicle. Um, we provide 15 to 60 ampere and then in the end, we have to do the math together with the customer. How long will it take if you have one stop, two stop, three stops um, in, the, uh, in, your, in your process, et cetera. So it's, right. it's very hard to, to say. Right, okay, thanks for that. Um, now, um, I don't wanna veer off too soon, but it's so tempting to talk about something I, I read the other day. It's about a project that VW or their truck, um, unit uh, involved in Scania, the truck unit. Um, they're involved in a project where the road is electrified and the trucks that travel along that road, provided they have a, what's called the pantograph uh, perched on top, it's like an aerial, like a TV aerial. That aerial picks up the electricity that's um, available on the road. So while the truck is uh, moving along, it's being charged up as well. Uh, you know, it's an electric truck and, and they're testing yeah. the system out. It sounds absolutely fascinating. It's different, it sounds different from yours because yours, um, yeah, there are two plates and they have to kind of align with each other. Whereas obviously if a moving truck is not really aligning with it, anything as far as I know, I don't know exactly how that works. But the potential for your system is, is there because I've seen that kind of system um, being tested and developed by Mercedes. Uh, they have a, an electric car prototype which uh, kind of moves onto a plate and it's inductively or wirelessly charged. So once those two plates are aligned, a bit like your system. 
So yeah. it's a really fascinating area to get into. Um, but what, I, I don't want to, you know, ask you too much about technical things, but I don't, I, my knowledge of these things are very limited. How can the electrified roads thing work? I understand the Wi-Fi system, or rather, the system that you're talking about, because I've, you know, I've got electric toothbrush. Other other people have got mobile phone chargers that are inductive, so we're kind of familiar with it. But how do you think the electrified road thing works? Yeah. Um, first of all, yes, I, I fully agree with you. That's going to be the future somehow. It's going to be not only be trucks, it's going to be e-mobilities. I don't know, it's going to be us uh, still driving those or it's going to be our kids or the kids afterwards. But it clear is the fossils are going to be less and less. So we have to think about making moving yeah, more electrified. And it's going to be the way to be either battery or another kind of uh, type of electric um, technology. And uh, the, the big difference from the spot charger, what, what we are doing and that I tried to mention it, um, is that we basically place and integrate it very simple into infrastructures. You don't have to have a lot of cost involved to place it somewhere to set up the charging system at all. And that's the big difference to the streets, what they're trying now. Either they have a, they have a pickup line similar like, like a tram or um, a train that picks up energy on the top of the, of the street and guides them through, or they have those inductive chargers basically um, put into the ground under the pavement or uh, under the concrete, which is also possible. Um, it's a completely different, uh, let's say, design of the coils and design of the inductive uh, system. And the big difference is there's a huge investment, of course. So uh, you, you're not able to basically reach it, it's, it's hidden, and you have to make the whole kil thousand of kilometers with those kinds of uh, inductive lines. So I'm quite sure there's going to be some applications who this might, might be working. If you have, let's say, a small area where, where you go all the time around and you need to have it power up 100% of the time. I rather think it's going to be go to those kind of stop charges where you have to have, for example, at every stoplight. And later, let's imagine you have that kind of uh, swarm technology in the cars where everything loop moves seeming less altogether because it's with not only 5G, but maybe 8G, whatever it's been yeah, in, in the thing, real time being managed, everyone talks to each other. So every time there's a stopping bridge uh, and there's gonna be a chance to implement those kind of spot chargers into the ground, I believe that's gonna be the way how charging is also later done by e-mobilities. You don't drive, you don't even think about energy, because either you charge when you have a stopping time on a certain stop, which is automatically calibrated and managed by your car because it's gonna be self-driving as well. Or the second opportunity is that that's the big beauty and compared to all the other, let's say traditional chargers, which are not so intelligent and smart, where you could also design that kind of uh, inductive charging in both ways. So it's not only one way in and the other one is a receptor, Basically, you can develop and program that kind of technology that you could exchange also uh, energy transfer between cars or between forklifts or between AGVs. So whenever they are close to each other, and they might be close to each other because they drive fully automatic in the future and there's, there's no chance of bumping into each other because the things are so smart, there's a way to transfer energy from one end of the car line to the end, to the other one. So, it's as you said. It's fascinating, and it's 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 the from our point, it's the start of a revolution. How energy is being used and transferred in the future. Nowadays, it's still a, a vision uh, of that. Let's say whole world uh, electrified economy. But looking into the structure of infra of infrastructure of uh, inter logistics and forklifts and warehouse and production, there is reality already. So that that's the big difference to those uh, huge lines, which yeah. you mentioned on the streets. Yeah, that, that's a, that's the interesting part. Um, these are so many interesting things, actually. You can say that I was just going to say these are new technologies which um, sound quite fantastical. Yeah, at the same time, they're also being implemented in the real world and commercialized. Obviously, you're a commercial company. You're you're actually got a real product. It's not a prototype. It's actually being implemented in yeah. in warehouses and so on and. Uh, the automotive industry might be testing lots of autonomous cars and things like that, but and electrification uh, infrastructures, as I said, um, with electrifying roads and 
inductive charging of individual cars and things like that. But it's all real. It's all like now. It's happening. It's it's the the you know it's uh, the change. Now is the time. Of, now is the yeah. time. Yeah, it's a change. And uh, I mean, we will see. We when we let's imagine, think back a little bit. Uh, maybe 20 years, 25 years ago, when an inductive cooking started. Everyone was like, "Oh, what's that? How, how is how is my my, my my cooking plate getting not hot not hot, but my uh, my meat is is being cooked?" And that's amazing. But nowadays, if you if you are maybe not in the US, but in Europe, if you implement a new kitchen, in 90% you have inductive in your in your cooking plate. Similar to the to the chargers nowadays. Uh, I mean, every new car that is maybe maybe not the the smallest one has a an inductive charger in included for your for your smartphone, and uh, just also think about wireless in terms of data transfer. Uh, 25 years when when I was a kid, I did uh, I did basically LAN parties with guys playing games. Everybody brought their little PC to it. They had to plug miles and lines, thousands of of meters of uh, lines to connect all together, and then have a joint game. That was actually 25, 30 years ago when we started to use um, data or transfer data wireless. Now it's the next step. We're going to do energy wireless, and I'm quite sure in a, in a in a in a couple of years there's not going to be any cord on any of the electricity's um, products that need electricity. Yeah, that brings me on to a person that I'm sure most viewers will will actually be familiar with the historical figure called Nikola Tesla. Now, I'm not obviously an expert or a historian uh, or technologist or anything, but I've heard of Nikola Tesla. He talked about he's, why he's actually he's actually in here. So <laughs> his invention uh, doing inductive charging is basically the core of the patterns which we have planted. So he 136 years ago, when he had it the first time to basically you know, find out how this works, he basically planted the seed for our uh, company. So yeah, we are we have a, actually our biggest meeting room is called after him. So when we when we have meetings all together, we say let's meet at Tesla because let's see he's the hero that made it possible that that kind of technology is now being available. For the broad market and nowadays for uh, AMRs and mobile robots, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as I say, I'm not a technologist or a historian, but I know enough to know that uh, I've seen enough YouTube videos to know that Nikola Tesla is um, a very uh, important figure for modern technology because he showed how t uh, electricity could be wirelessly distributed, and he was talking on a global scale and large amounts of electricity. So it's quite interesting now that um, wireless, as you say, wireless data transfer is happening and increasingly now wireless electric uh, electricity is, is going to be distributed wirelessly. And and that's, um, you know, thank you for the little anecdote about the meeting room. But yeah, it's, a, it's really interesting that it's taken this long for his ideas to become yeah. um, a reality. As I was saying before, We're talking about a revolution in a, in a way, um, but it's real. It's not a, you know, uh, it's a figment of our imagination. These things are actually happening. Electricity is coming into uh, society more and more. Um, why do you think it is? I don't mean to push you out of your um, uh, zone of, of expertise, but why do you think this kind of Technology has taken Nikola Tesla's ideas and technologies and innovations and uh, suggestions has taken so long to come to the market, if you like. Yeah, um, I, I come back to the to the to the phone charger uh, example. Uh, that's that, that's just a gimmick, like a little giveaway. But basically, what it is, um, it is the same technology. It has an inductive coil in there. And it transfers uh, by doing an either a resonant or or like an inductive charging uh, magnetic field, and the same similar is, thing is being implemented in the phones nowadays. So um, these kind of technologies have been tried to be to be implemented and to be made in a couple of years. But the the charger has an average five watt to 10 watt, And um, the efficiency of those coils to being optimized and being, being managed transfer the magnetic field is around in a charger, I would say maybe 
50 to in good case 75 percent so meaning if you put in 10 watt from one side and you only have 50 percent efficiency that means you only have five watt arriving at your phone which is for a phone charger fully okay um, because it, it's, it's not a big of a deal to lose five watt in, in a charging process. If you have hundreds or thousands of HVs and you charge with 3000 or 10,000 watt, you don't want to lose half of it by going being inefficient and to, or to be not efficient. And now coming back to your question, why, does, why, do it, why did it take so long? First of all, it is very complicated. As I mentioned, the four guys have been uh, researching that kind of technology over a couple of years. They are absolutely expert and have PhDs in, in their things they do. So they are much smarter than I, and I might be not be able to completely explain how it works. But to finding the right topology um, of the product to have um, the right coils being implemented, and last but not least, to have the embedded software which is needed, that's going to be the, the, was the big challenge over years and years. And to be honest, frankly speaking, there never have been a market for that, let's say five to 10 years ago, where you said, okay, we need that stuff now. We have to say we're also lucky that we have started five or eight years with, the, with research of that topic, having a product now being on market three years. And actually nowadays is the time of where energy is really needed in that kind of um, availability. So looking nowadays, five, five years earlier, I think the product would not have been that much of a big impact on a market. On the secondly, in five years, they're gonna be I'm quite sure hundreds of others who are doing a similar. I don't know if they are all gonna be successful in terms of size and compactness, because that is, that is the critical topic. You have to find a perfect combination of technique and technology and software to have it that small, not generating heat, not generating a lot of energy loss. And that's why basically I believe um, it, it took so long and last but not least, I think the technology to produce products has also been shifted. If you look back to the 70s or 18s, um, there was not that much of technology how to make a product. It was much more handwork. Nowadays, the processes are more uh, technology driven. Everything is more flexible and automated with robots. And nowadays, it makes it easier to make those products on a constant high quality level, which was maybe not possible 50 years ago. And last question about this, uh, uh, if I could call it Nikola Tesla type of world uh, that we're entering or already living in, the wireless yeah. sort of um, <laughs> transfer of data and electricity. One thing that always uh, worried me and probably lots of other people as well, is I always wondered how safe it is. Even Wi-Fi, the data transfer, it's not actually transferring electricity, but it's transferring data. I wonder sometimes how it's affecting my brain, my body, and so on. And electricity is even more worrying. I can understand that inductive charging, the type you're talking about, is two plates very close to each other, so the field is very uh, limited. And I was going to ask her to, to explain what CAN is as well. I've heard the term, um, but if you could briefly explain it, that would be really helpful. But is it is all this uh, new world we're entering safe, or, or should we be worried about it? No. Yes. Um, I, I think it's um, it's it's the similar topic when maybe maybe 30 years or 40 years when the first microwaves are coming out, people were were some kind of afraid. Oh, how is that working? What 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 does it mean for me? Can I stand in front of the microwave while it's on? Is it dangerous? Um, so of course, if things are new in the world, people are somehow afraid. Um, let's let's first of all. It's looking at this inductive charging technology, first I can say it's safe. And there is a high frequency magnetic field only between uh, the plates. And the good thing is, and that's the big difference also to those line, um, line uh, inductive chargers, which I told you were on, on the market since the 80s or 75, which are implemented through the ground. They have been constantly, let's say, active and there has some, been some kind of uh, outgoing inductive field, which are somehow to a certain extent could be, let's say, harmful um, for people. One of the example is uh, if you have a pacemaker, that is basically the only thing that is that is quite uh, serious in those kinds of open magnetic fields. The difference nowadays, and that's why it's 100% safe, is that the magnetic field is not on. It's only been active 
when you have the two plates a top aligned of each other. And as I said, the, the distance between is between one and four centimeters. So that means the magnetic field that's been generated is very, very concentrated and it's also shielded by the vehicle because it doesn't go to left or right. It's basically only between the plates. Um, what could happen if you have, let's say, um, if you have a wedding ring, because magnetic field is similar to your, um, to your stove or your, 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 your cooking aid in, uh, in the kitchen, uh, metal gets hot during inductive charging. But if you have your hands in between an active charger of our, our kind, that would mean you would actually lie under a 600 kilogram truck or an AGV. That would mean you have actually have some other problems than having just a, a very hot ring. You're gonna have most likely lost your arm. So it's completely um, from our point of view safe. Uh, if you are not having, let's say a pacemaker and going lying onto the pad and somehow try to activate it. Uh, and that just imagine nowadays we use contact chargers, which are open contacts, meaning they have to be, let's say, aligned. And if there's water or any other kind of uh, dirt material, there's huge energy being transferred directly to it. So if you would be uh, touching that with, uh, with, with some metal uh, object, you would be part of that circuit. So it's actually, uh, it's new. It's not dangerous, but of course there's a limitation on very limited uh, things. For example, a pacemaker being very close to it. And I mean like five centimeters to the pad, which is not really um, an opportunity. Okay, so uh, thanks for that explanation. And, and I, I wonder if you, if, I, if you wouldn't mind me um, uh, asking you to just briefly, I know you've you know, uh, you're not in that specific uh, area of the expertise, but can. I've heard of things like NFC. We're familiar with NFC, which is a near field communication. We use it to use our credit cards every day. We, you know, pay for things wi uh, wirelessly, I suppose, non contact. CAN is something I've heard of. Um, and there's other technology things I wanted to ask you about, like. Lead acid batteries is something I haven't heard for quite some time. The phrase um, lead acid, I used to hear it many years ago. Nowadays, you hear more lithium ion batteries. Uh, and I was also wanted to ask you about hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, can your system charge any type of battery? Fuel cell, a hydrogen fuel cell, I'm imagining, is kind of like a you know, a lithium ion battery in, in for all intents and purposes, it powers the vehicle and it needs charging up. So yeah, do, does your system charge, cause it, can it charge all three of those types of batteries? And uh, what is CAN just as a, you know, one sentence sort yeah. of, um, explanation? So I'm, I'm not a perfect uh, expert for that, but CAN is basically is the approbation of controller area network, which is basically a, a connectivity profile, which was designed, I think, by the company Bosch um, 50 years ago. So that's, that's kind of a standard how electrical um, parts or, or systems are talking to each other. So basically that, that basically says, I can get information in that kind of uh, prototype from one system into another. So that's it's maybe similar to um, plugging in um, some kind of, let's say a USB cable of your, of your external data uh, storage to, to plug into your PC. That's, that's also one conformity, that, that's the same. Everybody knows what it is. And similar is a CAN that's, that's basically a controller area network style, how data is transferred. And you have to have this to get certain information out of, for example, the battery. And normally lead acid batteries, um, sometimes they have, they don't have that all the time, or you have to have it installed additionally. Um, that's, that's the big difference where you can get more information from a lithium ion battery with a smart uh, battery management system. Coming back to your second question. Yes, we can charge any kind of battery, not hydro, hydro cell, that, that's a different technology. Um, but it does matter if it's uh, a lead acid, if it's a lead gel, uh, if it's a lithium iron technology, there's actually, I think, five, six, seven different or, or um, kind of lead uh, lithium technologies out there. 
What we recommend um, is L LFP or LTO technology. That's different chemicals, but they're all belonging to the lithium uh, technology because they are perfectly um, for short and quick chargers. Elite acid battery is the old, let's say very cheap style of battery, which is quite perfect for eight hours running, being, um, uh, being deleted by 60%, then you have to go to full charge again. And that makes the battery last, last the longest time. So you want to have a full cycle from 100%, maybe to 60, 40, 40% of depletion, and then basically recharge it the full stack up to 100% again. That's gonna. Uh, that's that's the only way to keep your lead acid battery, let's say, live a long time. If you have those kind of quick charging opportunities, the new lithium ion technologies are perfect because first of all, they're much smaller and you can empty them completely. There's a quite high limit on lead acid that you only should, uh, let's say, use it until 40, 30% state of charge. So you always have to keep something in otherwise you ruin the lifetime. And those lithium ion batteries, doesn't matter what kind of technology actually, they um, are very well designed to keep small uh, percentage of charging. And the best of course actually is if you charge your lithium ion battery in the top 40, 50%, always a little bit. So keep it in the top, uh, in the top state of charge areas. And uh, just as you have an idea to compare those the lithium ion batteries we recommend with our system have lifetimes of 7,000 and plus cycles, meaning you fully empty them. And that means linear, add, you, you add all the parts together. So when you use a 10%, another 10%, another 20%, another 30%, even if you charge in between, you add those to 100% and then you have one cycle. In the lead acid battery, you are around 800 to 1,500 cycles. But any time you put in power, one cycle is, let's say, taken off uh, the lifetime. And that means even if you only power by 10, 10% or 20%, um, that's, that's a huge difference uh, from the technologies. So coming back to our original questions, we can power any kind of battery we recommend. And the perfect application, which is an AGV has already been, let's say, standard, is lithium technologies because lifetime and size and compactness is much higher than on the large uh, four or 500 kilograms um, yeah, battery systems with acid. Okay, Gideon, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, A, it's taking a long time for me to get through all my questions, but I have come to the last question. <laughs> but the other thing is uh, I keep asking you questions uh, more about technology rather than business. And I know you're, um, you know, your job there or main responsibility is to promote the uh, technology. But obviously in your line of work, you have to be very okay, uh, familiar or uh, understand the technology that you're providing to people. So I don't feel too bad about asking you. One last question about um, something you mentioned in your presentation about how assembly processes in manufacturing uh, are sometimes being replaced by cell-based or robotic cell-based kind of production. I, th I heard that that was being tested and, and researched a couple of years ago. I've since heard that there are some, there's more progress being made. It seems that people like this idea of a cell-based production system rather than an assembly-based production system. The cell-based meaning that uh, AGVs or AMRs take, uh, say, for example, a, a car uh, body from one cell to another, one to get it welded, another to get the doors fitted or whatever, different cells for different uh, tasks. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that in the sense, uh, do you know of any other real examples? Have you supplied your um, uh, system, your charging system in those kind of areas? And uh, broadening it out, sort of what kind of, uh, yeah, I know you touched on it again in your presentation, but what kind of areas do you believe will be growth areas for your business going forward? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, great question. Um, first of all, yes, that is, 
as we are in Germany and Germany is one of, yeah, let's say one of the biggest industries, definitely automobile with all those German cars manufacturers, which are also the, the top of the line cars uh, worldwide. And yes, um, without telling too much out of the box, um, our systems are nowadays mainly in those high class manufacturing uh, sites of automotive. Meaning there's, as you mentioned perfectly, there's uh, a car body goes from one performance area where they put in, let's say the seats and the next one is getting the roof been done and the next one is having special side mirrors. So you, you basically have um, only the steps being performed which the single car on that little AGV needs to perform and you don't have to go through the whole line. So that, that, that's one of the applications where we put our most of our systems uh, I'm not allowed to say any of the of the big names because it's still, of course, um, you, you you can look at the map of uh, European or German car manufacturers, and let's say 60, 70 percent of those will find um, one of our systems in AGVs of our customers. So we don't provide to them directly, but of course we provide to the AGV OEMs that are then handing in the full uh, package of the of the AGV. Um, Looking into um, more, let's say, applications. Uh, one is, for example, a painting job uh, of, of the car manufacturing, where you have paint driving AGVs driving through a painting street and where everything has been um, been finished for the car. What we see is more and more warehouses. Um, we see uh, especially uh, goods to person applications where you have to, um, where uh, yeah, the goods are actually brought uh, from storages to person who picks them. A typical application would be, uh, which is I think well known is, that, is the Amazon Kiva case, which they brought out are almost seven, eight years now, where little carts are moving uh, shelves to the picker station and the picker doesn't go anywhere. It basically stands there and asks the robots to bring the parts. Um, so those kinds of applications, especially where I have a lot of vehicles having performing stopping times um, on a certain on a certain area, that's the application where we want to grow and where we know we can grow because at the moment the charging solutions there are unfortunately um, let's say semi-professional good in terms of failure or of being auto automated. And last but not least, uh, the good thing is there's actually not really limitation. We also have first project with boats where we basically where we basically charge uh, electrical boats in the water. As I said, that's, that's uh, waterproof IP68. So we have one plate attached to an electrical boat, which is powered by batteries. And then there is charging plates on, on the side. So whenever they stop for a certain time getting passengers on, they basically are charging uh, the uh, the boat nowadays. Drones are a topic. Um, of course, the agriculture is huge. There's going to be you know at 15, 20 years, I think no one will, will drive really um, the, the the large vehicles to to go on the fields. That's going to be done automatically because um, you can do it already by just navigating it. It's quite simple. And then having no one really being responsible driving that, that truck on the field, uh, that's going to be also an application where you need to have the vehicles then powered. Uh, and that's where we see us as well. Okay, and it's so tempting to ask you more questions in the, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and stop myself after this one last one. <laughs> and um, yeah, I w well, please. Please join Promat uh, in in uh, April, and uh, there's going to be three days of uh, I think six guys of us. So yeah. we will have time to to if you have more questions, feel free or go to the web page, send an email. That's also of course available at vicerian.com. Yeah. Okay. Well, just one last thing, uh, just as a speculation, just to pick your brain a little bit. Um. um yeah. So all these uh, changes towards electricity. Obviously, it's very exciting for people who are interested in greener, cleaner technology. They're very glad that the governments are promoting it and supporting uh, such initiatives. Um, it probably is uh, that kind of, those are the drivers, the government and the, the consumer in a way. That's why the industry is responding and, and creating new technology, uh, greener technologies, greener power systems. Uh, across many different sectors, as you yourself explained, in terms of your markets, potential markets, 
Um, how long do you think the petrol engine or that kind of old system has got? I know some people have said it's got another 50 years that uh, max the petrol engine is finished uh, for cars and uh, maybe agricultural vehicles like tractors and so on. Uh, as I say, I'm mindful of not asking you questions where it's not your expertise, but you know, you're a, a person just like everybody else and you've got expertise in this area. So what do you think in terms of the trends towards electricity? How quickly will electri electricity grow and will it replace the petrol engine and things like that? Yeah, um, uh, it's good. It's a very good question. And as you mentioned already, that's my personal opinion. I'm, uh, I'm not, yeah, I, don't, I only have from my experience of what I believe. So I just need to look actually at the moment and I do that quite uh, often because that's of course one of, uh, let's say, the spearheaders of the technology, that's Tesla. Just see what Tesla made in the last 10 years. Uh, the value of, uh, doesn't matter if it's going to be hyped and it's maybe too, too highly valued at the moment, but Tesla is showing us where we're going to be um, and actually already been able to drive on cars um, nowadays. And just imagine the steps he did over the last 10 years. I'm quite sure he will have more than three times the speed in terms of development and getting cars into the, into the road than he will do in the next 10 years. So meaning there will be much more car manufacturers going fully electric. Um, just GM in, in US announced in, uh, I think 2035, which is, uh, which is in 15 years, there will be no gas or petrol cars anymore by GM and GM is a huge player in the market. So I believe there's gonna be others doing the same step in a couple of years. Um, so I also believe there's always been some applications that will go on, on fuel or on, on fossil energy, which is hardly to, to let's say, which were difficult, large uh, tractors, for example, or at the moment forklifts uh, from a ton, from let's say 10 to 20 tons of transportation um, power, that kind of batteries are still very, uh, let's say too expensive and it will take much more time to develop them in a high efficiency that you have those being powered. But the majority, I believe, uh, especially on cars and on, on applications by the end of, uh, yeah, let's say uh, 2040 will be electrified. And that, that means at least 60 to 80%, I believe, on, on the streets. Let's see. Uh, let's let's look into the glass and uh, hopefully we'll be both still here, uh, you and me, on uh, not on that place, but on the world, uh, looking around what's happening. And maybe you can imagine in, in 20, 30 years, oh, yeah, there was that little kid I talked to uh, uh, with, with the blue plate. He talked about inductive charging. Now my, my Tesla or whatever it's called, I just drive it into my garage. I don't have to take anything uh, care about because it's going to be automatically placed on the right spot. It's been charged automatically, and uh, I get on my smart watch or whatever it's going to be, but then uh, telling me, oh, okay, I can go out again. I have 100% capacity on my battery. Let's see. Okay, Julian. Well, thank you very much for your time and your insights, and hopefully we'll both be around to see some of these technologies <laughs> come to uh, reality um, eventually. But even, even now, there's a lot of interesting things happening and it's quite lucky, you know, that we, we get to see them. So I'm sure you agree with that. Absolutely. And once again, thanks for the opportunity. Great honor. And it was really fun. I hope it was interesting for you and uh, for the watchers and readers and, and, and listeners. Um, yeah, let's keep in touch. As I mentioned, you can also get more information on www.wyferion.com. Um, yeah, we, as I said, we are here in Europe. We try to reach to the US this year. And hopefully, uh, yeah, on a, on a larger scale in the couple of years, what's, what's global support. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. Hope you have a great day. And yeah, thank you. Send us an email at sales at robotics and automation news .com to register for one of our many upcoming webinars. And if you'd like us to host your webinar, we have a range of options, including long-term lead generation packages and marketing campaigns. We look forward to hearing from you soon.